Good afternoon, everybody. Very excited to see everyone here. I just want to make sure that everyone's aware that uh, kind of some of the basis and context as far as why we have Adrian here today. Uh, earlier this year, Ripple acquired Medico for $250 million. Uh, Medico is a digital asset custody provider uh, in, the, uh, in the infrastructure space. And so here we have uh, Adrian Tricani, who started off uh, is a academic, pursuing his PhD uh, before making the transition over into, uh, into uh, industry. And so want to spend the next 30 minutes or so kind of getting to better understand what that transition was like and what led him to developing a business in the blockchain space. So uh, with that, uh, Adrian, if there's nothing you want to add, I'm happy to kick it off with maybe if you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and what led you to decide to even pursue your PhD in the first place. <laughs> It's not been an easy decision, to be honest. Uh, you know, when you finish your master's degree or you, you finish your studies, uh, you're facing with attractive job opportunities in general. You know, not, not everyone and not in every context and every economy, but in general, you're facing attractive, attractive opportunities. You can make a salary or you can decide to continue for a few more years with a shitty salary or no salary at all. Um, for a purpose which is not always going to pay off because you know if it can pay off and it does pay off if you want to continue your career in the academia but it's not clear that it would if you want to go in the industry and at this time i had um, actually an amazing offer in a hedge fund uh, in switzerland i mean actually a, a british hedge fund one of the top ones um, asking me to join uh, to to take a quant position uh, as an algo trader and uh, you know good pay uh, very good job description amazing uh, you know line on the cv uh, and on the other side, I had uh, this opportunity to do a PhD in mathematics. You know, I had a background in computer science. I did, uh, you know, I've been coding since I was, I, was, I was 12 years old. Then did a master in financial engineering um, and ended up doing a PhD in mathematics and high performance computing. Um, I wouldn't say that the PhD itself paid off. <laughs> so sorry, but I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, but I would say it paid off in a different way, which was that it, it gave me the opportunity personally to, on one side, of course, uh, produce content, you know, uh, write papers. Uh, I was published in a, in, in a few uh, good journals. Uh, but on the other side, uh, to also be able to look at new topics which were not necessarily strictly in the curriculum of my PhD. Uh, you know, blockchain at the time was far from being uh, considered a mathematics topic or a finance topic. So, you know, by a large extent, you, you, your, your supervisor would not be happy with this decision. But still, you know, gave me the time to start investigating Bitcoin in 2013. Realized that there were obvious arbitrage opportunities where you would have Bitcoin on one side being quoted for $25. On the other side would be $30. Uh, you say, well, oh my God, this is like 20% arbitrage with zero risk in principle. Uh, and so started during my PhD time, and please don't repeat this to my ex-supervisor, uh, to build uh, arbitrager uh, bots uh, that would connect to the various exchanges, trade, and make profits. And it worked very well until um, a couple of these exchanges got bankrupt, got hacked, uh, disappeared. For some of you that were maybe on this market at the time, you may remember Bitcoin Central in France and Bitcoin 24 in Germany, uh, followed not so far uh, in the future, in, in the distant future, by empty gox. Well, I was a victim on most of these hacks. <laughs> I lost a lot of Bitcoins at the time, things which uh, you, know, you would feel bad if you think about the potential value that it is today. Uh, anyhow, uh, it, it led me to uh, consider uh, what this industry could become um, uh, this cryptocurrency and blockchain industry could become. And the conclusion at the time was that it would not stop with Bitcoin. It would get into uh, the wider asset market, you know, tokenization, you know, these this thousands of trillions of dollars worth of assets, um, and uh, that there would, there would be a need for infrastructure. And so during the PhD, I was working in the hedge fund industry. Uh, and and uh, at the end of the PhD, I decided to create a company. I see. So before we kind of go into your decision to kind of go and create a company, I guess, what was your experience like? I think there's a number of folks in the room right now that are currently studying for their PhD. What were some of the aspects of your experience that you found to be super helpful and enjoyable and other aspects of it that you found to be a little more challenging or difficult? Well, my experience in the, in the PhD was not so good, to be honest. Uh, not so good because it felt, and some people may agree, some people may strongly disagree, uh, but it felt that you had to write, uh, to, 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 re to do research or to write papers uh, on the topics which were, let's say, à la mode, right? which were trendy. Uh, and if you, would, if you would write on topics which were not à la mode, um, uh, you would not be able to publish 
And if you will not be able to publish, then your PhD would not be a success. And your career in academia would not be a success. And so there was a lot of top-down pressure to, um, let's say, focus on topics which were relevant from the point of view of editors in top journals. Um, and um, sometimes I would completely disagree with uh, their views uh, on not necessarily mathematics, but more the economics and finance um, uh, research. And uh, I knew that if I were, if I were coming with uh, conclusions or hypotheses which would be too different from the sort of general narrative, I would not be received with, uh, you know, <laughs> hands clapping, clapping in the air. Um, so that was maybe the, down, the, the, the negative side. Now, the positive side is that I don't think uh, you ever have in your life another opportunity that, that you have in a PhD to open your mind to new things. If you're willing to go beyond uh, the strict curriculum that uh, you know, you're, you're asked to go through, you know, the, the, the teaching, uh, the, the, the specific topics that you, are, you have subscribed for, uh, this is the only opportunity in your life where you can potentially make a small salary and survive, and at the same time have a bit of bandwidth uh, to be looking at new things. And clearly, what I see in this event is, is exactly the, the materialization of what I'm saying. You know, the ability to start thinking about new topics such as you know, AMMs. You know, I, I didn't see the first half of the presentation, but the second half was very interesting. You know, I saw some mathematical uh, finance on, you know, with the expectations, risk-neutral expectations and all, uh, sort of old memories. But um, those are the things where you know, suddenly you can say, oh my God, uh, I am seeing here an opportunity, either by solving an issue uh, or simply by exploiting new technology, new mathematics, you know, new science to create something. And this is what happened in, in my context. Got it. All right. And so I guess as far as writing papers and all of that as uh, getting published and everything, I think one thing that is very common at times, it feels, is that writing a textbook that you can also leverage uh, for other folks to be able to learn from all of your learnings as well. Uh, you actually did take uh, that step and helped co-author a, uh, a blockchain and distributed ledgers uh, textbook. Tell us a little bit more about what that experience was like and if you would recommend that to others in the audience as well. Yeah, difficult. Um, you know, I think if you, if you are a seasoned uh, researcher or academic, you are really used to writing scientific, uh, you know, contents. And uh, it becomes your expertise. And, uh, you know, it's like an actor can act, you know, a researcher can write. And um, I've not done enough research that uh, it is a, uh, my first nature. So writing scientific content is not something I can do without thinking. And... Um, uh, this is something that I did uh, with Alexander Lipton, you know, so very you know, well-known person in the, in, you know, in the academia and in banking, um, who uh, is much more trained than I am in writing scientific uh, uh, content. And uh, we decided to do this a few years ago while he was obviously employed, you know, he's a very senior uh, banker, and while I was also employed uh, in my own company. And this was a big challenge, you know. Uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you have problems every day, you're constantly solving issues, you're constant, constantly thinking, how am I going to survive? How, how am I going to find liquidity? Um, of course, from the outside, you think everything is going fine. But you know, from the inside, you say, oh my god, everything is collapsing. Right? It's a complete disaster. Um, and um, uh, you have to, to, to do this. And then it's like, why the hell did I accept to write this book? You know, what, what a stupid idea, stupidest idea in my life. Um, but you know, then you're committed to it, and you have a co-author, and uh, you realize, my god, he's producing more content than I am. So you know, I have kind of so, uh, social pressure to, uh, to start producing content also. Um, and you know, over time, you miss your deadlines, and you miss your deadlines, but you end up doing it. You know? And uh, something that was supposed to take you know, less than a year because we thought we had uh, enough content to do it, well, ended up taking two years and a half. Um, <laughs> but we did it. You know? And the, the, the reality is that, why did we do it initially? And the reason is that um, Alexander and I were sharing um, uh, you know, a lecture. You know, we were lecturing on blockchain and, and cryptography uh, at the EPFL, which is the engineering school in, in Lausanne. Uh, in Switzerland, and uh, we realized that the contents we could find in terms of textbooks would be either too Bitcoin-centric or cryptography-centric, which would be great for you know, software engineers, but not great uh, for finance uh, engineers or mathematicians, or would be the other way around, very you know, economics, finance-oriented, with almost no technol technical content. And so we say, well, there is an ob obvious opportunity here to bridge the two and have something which covers everything from the foundation of money, you know, how money appeared and how it evolved over time, um, through uh, how, it's, how blockchain actually, why blockchain appeared and how it works, to where it could lead us in the future. Got it. Okay. 
And I guess as yeah, obviously very common though in any type of product development, you always think it's gonna take one quarter or two and it ends up ballooning a little bit longer. So let's make that switch, let's transition now a little bit into kind of what led you to developing a, a business within the custody space. I think you kind of talked a little bit or alluded to how you saw an opportunity in real world asset tokenization or all that would be coming. But why, why Spix, why specifically did you decide the custody segment versus all the other areas in the, in the blockchain industry? So, you know, uh, some people in the room may have heard this story already, Eric. Uh, this is not the first time you'll hear this, but um, the, when you, if you have lived through the years of Bitcoin in, you know, 2010, 12, 13, and seen how immature this market was, it was amazing, uh, frankly speaking. It's a bit like the internet in the 90s, you know, you could do everything. You could, with the internet, you could kind of hack the computer of any, anybody you knew just by you know, sending a few comments. And it was just amazing. The same was almost true with cryptocurrencies. You know, uh, it was extremely mature. The software ecosystem didn't exist. And therefore, every day you would hear of that guy losing thousands of bitcoins, that other company losing all of the deposits of their clients, uh, and the user experience would be a disaster. So. Uh, being a victim myself of this, as I explained, um, I concluded that this market would be converging uh, to something more institutional. But the motivation behind it was that I was convinced that everything would be tokenized. And uh, God knows how wrong I was on the timing, right? I mean, um, I don't even know how Medaco survived as a company with a decade of wrong market timing. You know, I, I was in 2015, think about it, it's almost a decade ago, I was uh, in big events speaking to bankers, speaking to banking conferences, and explaining to everyone with a lot of confidence that every single asset on the planet would be tokenized imminently. Uh, so you know, starting with fiat currencies, uh, continuing with uh, you know, equities, fixed income securities, derivatives, commodities, you know, real estate, etc. Everything would be tokenized. And I had slides showing how fast it could go in a hockey stick pattern. You know? And um, the whole narrative around Medaco, which, is, uh, uh, which was my company, was based upon this idea that not just Bitcoin would exist, but actually these hundreds or, or these thousands of, of trillions of dollars worth of assets. And again, we're almost a decade later, and um, what, what, is, what is there? You know, there are stable coins, and it's yeah. quite successful, you know, a few dozens of billions of dollars worth of assets, but what is it in the great scheme of things? Nothing, you know. And um, if you look now at the main studies on the market, you will note that, um, you know, three years ago, World Economic Forum predicted that by 2030, there would be, what was it, 20 trillion dollar worth of assets uh, tokenized. And actually, as you move to the future, not only <laughs> is this push also to the future of the prediction, but the amount of assets is reducing. <laughs> now, if you look at the latest Citi report last year, Citibank report, I think they predict for 2030, they predict only, what is it, 5 trillion or something like this? 7 trillion? So it's already halved uh, by just a little bit. of. So we're getting there. Uh, obviously, everything will be tokenized at some point, eventually. The question is, how do we get there? Is it a linear pattern? Is it a quadratic pattern? Is it an exponential? Is it a hockey stick? I used to think it would be sort of a you know, fast growth exponential curve. I'm now thinking it's more going to be of a, a, a hockey stick pattern. And the reason for this is it's so dependent on the ecosystem factors. You, know, you can't be just a guy you know, in your basement creating a tokenization firm. You, know, you have to have all of the market participants, the banks, the brokers, uh, all form of intermediaries that are actually taking place and accepting that they are moving to something new roughly at the same time, because again, it's an ecosystem play. Or you go native on the blockchain, and if you go native on the blockchain, everything is fine. You can use AMM and you're dealing with retail to retail, for instance, that's fine. But most of these assets are heavily regulated, so you can't go retail on the blockchain natively without having you know, KYCs everywhere, AML constraints, etc. And because of this, it means that you still rely because of the regulators, you know, good or bad, you know, uh, on a lot of intermediation, and therefore you rely on the existing incumbents, which are the banks um, and other regulated entities. Therefore, you know, coming back to the point, um, well, at this time I did not know that it would be so slow. I thought it was going to be very fast. Uh, and I, my conclusion was, okay, if this is happening, what's the first thing that companies are going to need? And that was the infrastructure to actually store and manage these assets. And therefore, Metaco was formed. Okay, so bringing it back right then to that original formation of Medico, kind of recently just finished your PhD, moved from academia into starting your own company. What were some of the biggest surprises you had? I think you probably came in thinking, as you said, things were going to accelerate really quickly. That part didn't end up happening, but other experiences that you had that were big surprises. Well, how slow banks are uh, is maybe the biggest <laughs> learning. Um, I think this is something we can say for 
any big company. Any big company has a lot of inertia, has a lot of frictions to make any decision, and that's, that's obvious because the larger the company, the harder it is to reach a consensus. You know, if you think about uh, in terms of blockchain, you know, uh, if you have a blockchain with three nodes reaching consensus, you know, you have, a, you know, have whatever uh, Byzantine uh, fault tolerance protocol and, you know, reach a consensus in milliseconds. If you have 1,000s of nodes, it doesn't grow linearly, right? It's, it's a very complex thing to reach a consensus. And of course, this is why then you end up in different algorithms, such as proof of work and a proof of stake. But um, now, push, the, push this to the, to the scale of a company. A company is the same thing. It has to reach a consensus to operate. It, when it makes a decision, it needs a lot of people to agree. The more centralized it is and the more power you give to the CEO, the potentially faster it can, it can move. But still, you know, there are friction. It has, it, the CEO has to push this down to the rest of the company. And, uh, so, in general, large companies move, move slowly. But if you add to this the friction of the regulators, well, it's not just the people. Then you have to convince the government. And that's freaking difficult. That's freaking difficult. You know, banks, uh, anything they do, you want, to, you want to open a business selling sandwiches to a bank, good, good, <laughs> good freaking lord, good chance. You know, it's, it's horribly difficult. Because onboarding a bank um, is in itself is a venture. You know, onboarding a bank can take a year. Selling something to a bank, signing a contract, you know, being selected means going to a, an RFP, a request for proposal, can be a year. So your sales cycle, if you win the bank, which generally you don't, potentially takes you two years. And that's from the time you think the opportunity exists to the time you potentially close your deal and you onboard it. If you take into account the time that you have to convince the bank that this opportunity exists and the time that uh, uh, potentially they tell you that it's, they, they want to do something, but it's just innovation, a prototype that's never going to turn into a real product and a real contract, you potentially have already lost three years. And these learnings are extremely tough. You know, as a startup, you, you, know, you prove yourself uh, to investors, to your shareholders, to the market, um, uh, to, to the clients you're signing. And, um, when your market, which was our market, is the banking market, and it takes so much time to convince your first clients, and then so much time to create momentum, it can kill you. And I think we, we were lucky enough at Medaco to have a number of um, ex-entrepreneurs and corporate shareholders that had more patience than the traditional financial VC. I think financial VC would have already ordered me to pivot the company way, a long time ago and say, well, don't touch the freaking banks, you know, go to something else. You sell sandwiches if you want, but no banks. Yeah. <laughs> so, so thinking about how you've been working on Medico now for almost a decade, I imagine that the development and growth of the organization has been very different from like the first couple of months to the first couple of years to kind of five years in to more recently. Can you talk a little bit about what scaling has been like and some of the challenges there, even if whether it's recruiting, sales, anything like that? Yeah, and also the mistakes I made. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the main yeah. mistakes I made. But um, formally, the company was founded in 2015, so it is indeed almost a decade ago. The reality is that uh, from 2015 to 2018, almost nothing happened from a product point of view. It was mostly consulting because we had to finance the company, and we were not finding product fit. We were trying, we were building prototypes, but nobody was ready to pay for them. And so it's only in 2018 that uh, finally we got the first hook. We were able to raise a seed round. We raised three million at the time. Uh, and uh, we were able to close our first couple of clients. And one of them actually was, uh, you know, maybe not couple one, but the third client was DBS Bank, one of the largest, bank in, largest banks in Asia. Um, that um, at the time, for some reason, you know, decided to be early movers in this space and uh, were looking for a solution. And, we were first on the market because we'd been waiting for three years, right? So we had something to sell. And we were able to get them. And this first bank, because it was so new to them, were a little bit less painful in terms of uh, requests for proposals, in terms of uh, you know, onboarding complexities, etc. So we were able to actually onboard a few banks uh, in the first year you know, in a much easier way than what we, what we were later. But then, then it was still very hard to scale because you know, initially your, your first clients, they don't want to do a press release with you. They say, well, you know, we don't know if you're going to survive next year. Why would we give you the credibility of the bank? And why would you give you our name? Uh, if you could be dead next year, you know, it's, you know it's, it's hurting our reputation. So no, we're not making press release. So essentially, you're signing these clients, and nobody knows about it. So it's not helping you. And you try to create momentum, but nothing really happens. And um, this is where maybe my biggest learning came. Um, you know, having an engineering background and having uh, you know, built in the, the first lines of code of the, of the platform, um, I always thought that uh, you're successful in a business because you have uh, the best product, you have a great product. 
And um, I actually realized that, uh, and way too late, only in 2020, actually, five years later, uh, that you're successful in your business because the market thinks that you have a great product, not because you have a great product. And how do you get the market to think that you have a great product? By spamming the market with marketing. Right? And therefore, um, your investments as a startup, and I would not make this mistake again in the future, your investments must not be in having the most amazing engineering team on day one. You need just enough engineering, you know, just the minimum of what is good enough to build a you know, prototype of a product. What you need is a big marketing and sales budget. You need to spam the market with information about yourself, and you need to spam the market with dozens of sales. Junior sales can be interns, you know, coming out of school that are making phone calls every, everywhere and uh, you know, getting paid on this. And for an engineer, in particular a Swiss engineer, you know, we're very conservative in Switzerland in the sense that we, you know, we, we like to do things perfectly, we wait for the product to be ready before we speak about it, etc. Um, it is very hard to get to this point where you understand that um, you have to think like a year ahead and start speaking about one year ahead and not speaking about the present too much. When did you think that Medico had made it? Was that at that first sale to DBS or was it later on? Or did you, were you as an entrepreneur, are you always concerned that anything could happen? You never think that you've made it. I still don't think I've made it, frankly speaking. Um, and in, at some point, I don't know if I can speak for every entrepreneur, but at least I'll speak for myself. It makes you a little bit, let's say, sociopathic. What I mean by this is that um, you no longer get the kick of, oh, I won that thing, or the depression, or I've lost that thing, because you're constantly oscillating with this volatility between, oh, it's a great day and it's a shitty day. And so your brain starts adjusting to it and filtering from a mathematical standpoint, filters this noise of happy and unhappy, and you become a straight line. Um, and, um, you know, therefore, it's not even that you're really anxious or that you're really excited. For me, at least, it's been, well, it's my job. I have now employees that I need to make sure are not losing their job. I've, I've, in a way, invested three, four years of my life, more five years of my life into this. I'm not going to fail. And I'm going to hold on to it until it succeeds. And then the criterion of a success is not trivial. You know, we've been acquired by Ripple. Is this a success? Well, it's a successful milestone. Is this a success? Well, I consider that potentially it will be a success when we all IPO together. But then if we IPO, is this still a success or is it that we have to triple the value in the market? You know, and at some point you realize, oh my God, capitalism is a disaster. You, know? you, never, have, you never get to an end where you feel I've achieved it. Um, and so you indeed become a bit of a sociopathic personality. <laughs> So I guess um, before we move on to some kind of a little bit more about the opportunity with uh, Ripple and Medico, let's say, uh, I assume that Medico was probably not courted by only one organization at some point during its life cycle. Uh, what led you to decide that the timing wise, as we were kind of talking about whether it's IPO or exit or anything like that, what led you to decide that this was the right time to sell versus any time in the past or holding on and waiting until a future date? I still don't know if it was the right time. <laughs> I've never known. I've really never known. Uh, and it's been one of the toughest decisions in my life to the point that uh, I'm normally a person, and I have to, uh, that makes tough decisions and don't, that, don't, you know, I don't regret them, even if they end up being wrong. This one, I was not able to make it. I had to delegate the decision to my wife. <laughs> and, uh, and she had a hard time making it, but she ended up making it. Um, but um, the thing is, you know, the. One of the, the things that made me you know, take the opportunity and I think um, uh, you know, made, made this be a success is also that at some point you realize, uh, do you want to you know, continue by yourself and um, have this big volatility that I was speaking about or do you want to de-risk and potentially have a much larger opportunity together? Maybe individually from a capitalistic point of view it's less attractive, but you've de-risked and you have a much larger opportunity now. And you know, for those of you who've done financial mathematics, you know, if you take the sort of risk-neutral expectation, you know, it's kind of the, you're adjusting the risk with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the return, and you get to this question, which one is more uh, attractive, which one is more rational? Um, I knew uh, before, like the year before, we had had two acquisition opportunities, real ones, um, that we ended up not, not taking, not just because the timing was not necessarily the best, but also because the structure of the offers and what they, ended up, what they wanted to extract out of it, typically just take the technology and take the people and kill all of the client relations, uh, like big banks in what they do, you know, uh, was a disaster to all of the clients that I had shaken hands and say, well, no, we're going to support you for the next 10 years. 
and then I get acquired, then we just say, sorry guys, you know, I've made a, a bit of money, but uh, you know, uh, too bad for you, just change the provider. You know, this is not something I wanted to do. And when we started the discussions uh, together, uh, if you remember, that was one of the first questions I asked, you know, what is the strategy? Are you gonna essentially kill the client relations we have, or is, it, is the, the goal to build on what we have and build together? And it was that. It was, that. was the timing perfect? I don't know, you know, maybe I should have waited two years and sold it for four times the price. I don't know. Um, uh, or maybe I would have waited uh, a couple of years and I've gone bankrupt. I don't know. So uh, I think in the end, um, uh, for both parties, it's been a good deal. I think we're doing great business together and I certainly don't regret the decision. Excellent. And so as a combined organization now, how do you view competition? I think before, uh, as a pure digital asset custody infrastructure provider, I think that you had one set of competitors. Uh, as a combined organization, it feels like the competition may have evolved or there's different ways to think about it as, a, as, as you kind of go after this traditional um, banking segment or the customer base that you want to continue to maintain and provide new services to. How do you, how do you view that now as, a, as we are, are looking at the future together? I still see exactly the same asshole competitors. <laughs> still exactly the same companies. You still hate them, they still hate us, uh, and we still fight to death. You know, it's, 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 uh, you have to live through it to see it. You know, and it's, it's much more intense when it's, uh, when it's your company than when you are in a big corporate and you're in you know, Google competing with Microsoft. Uh, when it's your company and you know your, your survival de uh, depends on beating the competition, it becomes something extremely personal. And I think at Medaco we were somewhat able to take perspective and say, well, yeah, well, you know, they're doing the same as we do, so we don't like them, but it's not becoming too personal, but our competitors hated us. You know, they would have celebrated us being shot by a car in the street, you know, really, you know, we, are, we have stories that you would not believe. So, um, the, of course, the, the set of competitors has evolved, it's probably broadened, but um, uh, some of the competitors uh, that we competed with are still very much here. Um, they're still as uh, aggressive in their narratives and their you know, fake marketing, disinformation, etc., to uh, make sure they can uh, prevent Medaco from growing. But again, um, you know, when you take a bit of perspective, you, under, you, you accept the fact that it's rational. They do the same as you do, and sort of game theory equilibrium is that, well, we hate each other and we, 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 we fight to death. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that colorful response in terms of how you view competitors. Uh, one final question uh, for you, which is um, a lot of the folks in this room might one day consider to go into going into starting their own business as well. I guess as you look back on your journey, either what is some advice you would give to your, your younger self uh, when you moved into starting and in, moving into entrepreneurship or more generally, what would you give to this audience here? Well, one that I already gave, but I'm going to repeat, is so important that I'm going to repeat, is don't overthink the you know, quality of the product, the engineering, etc. For a pure tech company, which is really like, I don't know, building microprocessors with a new way of printing on you know, two nanometers, sort of, okay, maybe this is pure tech and really you have to have the best patents, okay? But unless you're in something which is so protected by patents and by you know, very vertical expertise, um, what's going to make differentiate you is how aggressively you're able to sell. And again, how aggressively you're able to sell is not necessarily the quality of your product, and that's an important learning. The other thing is, um, um, I think here on, in uh, the American continent, uh, people don't have this issue, but if you're in Europe, you tend to think small, to raise small money, to wait too late to raise money. Um, and if and when I would do it again, I would be much bolder in how much money I'm, I raise. I would go much faster for the 20, 30 million tickets, uh, even accepting a bit more dilution. Of course, it's easier to say when you've already sold the company because raising the next time, you know, you have much more credibility with the venture capital investors um, than when it's your first company. But, you know, something to keep in mind. Awesome. Well, everybody, thank you so much, Adrian, for your time and for sharing your wisdom. Any questions? All right, we got one in the corner. Hi, thank you for for your your uh, testimony on on building a company. Really interesting. Uh, my question was regarding the the features of Metaco and what it brings to the whole XRP ledger ecosystem. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, thank you. So we are in practice we are a digital asset custody infrastructure provider. What does it mean? Well. As you know, you can, you can store, well, all digital assets are protected by cryptography, asymmetric cryptography. Uh, at the core of it, there is a concept of private key. 
this private key, you have to put it somewhere. If you're in, on the retail market, you would put this private key on a Ledger Nano or equivalent or on a piece of paper, which you, you know, dig in a bunker or whatever you want. But um, on the enterprise market, or of course, even, even more in the banking markets, you need to have proper security around the key, proper security around the governance, uh, proper security around the accounting. And essentially what we provide is the entire stack from key management, governance, accounting, connectivity to Web3, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, if I give you a few keywords for key management, typically we would support a number of uh, hardware security module, uh, you know, security models, but also multi-party computation, which is a way of splitting keys in multiple shards and you know, uh, ensuring that the, the risk is not centralized in a, in a single point of failure. Um, but then governance is generally where you have the next weak point, which is, you know, sure, I've protected my keys, but at some point I need to use them, right? Uh, my keys are in an HSM, a hardware security module, or are MP split with MPC. Cool. But when I actually want to sign a transaction, who decides that the transaction can be signed? And that's the next biggest weak point in the solution, you know. Uh, is it the CEO of the company? Is it the founder? Is it the CISO, the chief security? Well, no, you know, those are single point of failure. So you need to start thinking governance. Um, what are the quorums that you put in place? What I do? How do you structure this in a point that no one, even the most trusted employee, is able to execute something but at the same, uh, by himself, but at the same time that you have a business which is agile, where your clients can uh, say, I want to withdraw assets and it's, it feels instant. Um, and despite the fact that it's instant, it's still secure. So this is what we provide, and uh, we've specialized into selling this to banks. So it's a very much banking-grade solution where security is, uh, uh, is at the core of everything. Uh, the target operating models in terms of you know, deploying on SaaS, deploying on premise uh, is critical. The different uh, platforms that we support, you know, from any form of hardware, uh, stack, or you know, all of the sort of best practices with Docker, containerization, and, and Kubernetes, et cetera. So very flexible, um, and it has allowed us to become a standard today in this industry as a custody infrastructure. on the fact that um, I assume you had a lot of uh, Swiss-based banks as, as, as customers, right? You're Swiss-based. Um, not as customers. Not as customers. I'll, 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 yeah. Okay. Anyway, what, what's your view um, on which jurisdiction and which banking industry in which jurisdiction is the most advanced in terms of adopting yeah. this technology? So, not Switzerland. Unfortunately, this is why we don't have a lot of Swiss. We have, but we don't have a lot. Um, Switzerland has been one of the pioneers in this field. So some of the first banks in the world that started a digital asset initiatives uh, initiative were Swiss. But it's also a very conservative country. And after these two, three, or four banks that started early, then everything stopped. The big banks did not move. Some of them are starting to move, but it's still very slow. Uh, the markets that have moved much, much more aggressively are Singapore, Germany, um, I would say more generally Southeast Asia. Now Hong Kong is also catching up. In Europe, I would say that France is starting to catch up. Um, Italy also is starting. But uh, you know, if you look um, outside of Europe and, and APAC, I would typically say that uh, South Africa and um, uh, you know, du Dubai, the Dubai region, let's say in general, Abu Dhabi, are, are, are becoming attractive. But at this current time, it is not America, it is not Switzerland. America actually is an absolute disaster, absolute disaster. Um, they, they had banks that were moving, but in general, the regulators, in particular the SEC, but others have been so strict on what the banks are able to do, they're not able to use a public chain. So, I mean, if you can't use a public chain, what are you doing in blockchain? You know, is a private chain even relevant? You know, it's just a database with a bit of cryptography, right? So, um, why, would you, why would you do blockchain if you can't use public chain? Then even if you could, you're not allowed to use blockchain as the books and records. So you're not allowed to use the, the blockchain as being the golden source of the accounting, which means you have to use the traditional, you know, sort of transfer agents and databases systems uh, to, to, to keep the who owns what information. So if you have to do it, then even your private blockchain is not so relevant because you have to keep the information somewhere else anyhow. Um, and so, um, yeah, every you know, relevant bank in the US is working on this technology, but until they get into a productive uh, setup that is truly bringing value to them, uh, well, probably at least a couple of, of years, probably more. Um, 
Uh, hey, Santiago Orquez here. Um, I was just wondering, uh, when you did all your first rounds, uh, what was your reasoning behind the plan you had for uh, what were you going to use? What, was gonna, what were you going to do with that money to go forward with your company? So the first financing round, you mean? Fundraising? Yeah. Uh, well, I had a horrible business plan that um, I don't dare opening again because then I get a heart attack and I get, sh I get ashamed of my, pre of my past work. But uh, <laughs> I still had a business plan, you know. It was pretty long, I think like 30 pages. And I sent this to investors and they said, what the hell are you sending me 30 pages? I, want ju I just want to, s to see 10 slides. <laughs> so, well, okay. Um, uh, but my, you know, my business plan was uh, focused on, you know, building an amazing product, uh, you know, changing the world and, uh, you know, tokenizing everything. and. Uh, uh, I was lucky enough that um, you know, some investors, in particular corporate investors, less so with financial VC, but corporate VC, CVC, um, believed in it. And you know, I saw one of them, uh, one of our, well, you, you've met him, but I'm not going to na name his name, but uh, uh, one of our first corporate VC, um, I saw him again uh, last month and uh, um, I was, uh, we were together in a, in, at an event and I, I told a guy, you know, uh, this is one of our first investors, you know, he, he, uh, he's the one without him, the company would have not existed. And uh, the investor said, um, oh, thank you so much, Adrian, for recognizing it. You know, I, I'm flattered. And I say, well, don't be so sure it's a flattery because if I had been you at the time, I would never have invested in my company. <laughs> so you probably were stupid at the time. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, um, uh, so uh, we, we had the chance to find a couple of, uh, well, uh, more than a couple, but a few corporate investors, uh, actually Swisscom, Swiss Post, um, uh, SIGPA, you know, a lot of the big corporates in Switzerland, actually, um, that were in the uh, infrastructure, telecommunication, banking, and central bank markets. And um, because uh, those were mostly corporate VC, they were much more patient as investors and much more, let's say, willing to look forward, you know, innovation, strategy, etc., than the traditional VC, who just looks at multiples. Now, is it the good approach for those of you who are raising funds or would be raising funds in the future? Well, you know, raising from corporate VC is not only upside. You know, they may be more tolerant, they may be more interested to the strategic opportunities, but they also, they don't really care about your financial, you know, growth. Uh, they don't care so much about your valuation. And therefore, you end up with a misalignment of the incentives where, you know, your shareholders and your board of directors doesn't really care if you succeed. You know, they, they just see you as a nice, you know, uh, a nice strategic opportunity to learn about the field and uh, potentially bring a little bit of expertise to their own company. So it's a balance, but in our case, it paid off.